In the grand scheme of things, the bloody chancer's crew had been forced to make a certain trade. The man who had killed their reliable pirate pal Tumas was now doing his old jobs around the burgeoning sanctuary, never far from a loaded gun and motivated gunman. The new guy, Paulo, claimed to be a man of ancient fame, brought to the future by Stasis and to Reticot by his IPA handlers. Supposedly, his motivation in killing Tumas had been mercy, not malice, but such a narrative wasn't going to get much traction anytime soon. The others weren't entirely sure whether killing Paulo and moving on wasn't their best bet. Paulo, of course, was fully aware of this. He needed a way to begin repaying the strange gang that he had wound up in, and on a personal level, wished for a way to punish the IPA for bringing this whole dreadful scenario about. A way to service both needs poked its head up after a few days, or should I say, poked its finger up. Another of those metal appendages of the mover inside the planet blasted up on the other side of the river, complete with its usual set of death robot guards. Knowing the drill, the crew went out at once to blow it all to smithereens before any mischief was achieved. Paulo was dragged behind Huntsman on a rope. You got computers or anything with an old Marcom signal generator? Paulo asked. We got this, Staves replied, motioning to his big blowwork gun. We can kill the living metal. Natural, if you think about it. Mrs. Shar, don't you know what I mean? Paulo begged, but Shah shrugged. If you think we have IPA tech here, you're dead wrong. Emphasis on the dead. Ignore him, he's just lying again, Boy insisted. Ah, I'm getting tired of this man. There's another way to shut the strands down, though. Paulo reached into both armpits of his shirt and pulled out some flappy pieces of colorful clayish stuff. Hygiene's hard on the rim. But actually there was more to this, as he slapped the pieces together and scrunched them up into a ball. By now, Huntsman had his rifle pointed squarely at Paulo. What kind of paste you hiding in there, butter? Huntsman demanded. Cut me loose and I'll blow that thing back to its master, Paulo offered. Huntsman wasn't having it and just carried on dragging Paulo towards a boulder closer to the metal menace. The crew were psyching themselves up for a gun battle with the death robots, but Paulo had other ideas. He tore a tiny piece of gunk from his new ball of mystery mash and stuck it to the rope around his waist. Then he touched a timekeeping device on his wrist to it, and there was a little flash. The rope fell loose. Get back here, butter! Huntsman roared as Paulo bolted. He was about to shoot, but Paulo was running right into the danger zone on his own. He's had enough of us already, Kerma sneered. Paulo started zipping left and right as the death robots clocked him and blasted old cosmic crud in his direction. A few needles thwacked into him, but he carried on pounding forwards. Almost stumbling to the ground, he swung his arm out and let the manky ball fly. It slapped onto the metal cylinder and stuck there. The death robots turned to look at it briefly, but all it was doing was emitting a faint smoke. No danger, so they turned to finish off Paulo. That's when the entire scene was engulfed in light and a shockwave picked Paulo up and threw him a few meters back. The mover piece was split apart and set ablaze, while the death robots were instantly disassembled and scattered across the dirt in all directions. He's definitely the overlord, Stave said, peeking around his rock at the scene. Paulo was lying still on the floor, smoke rising from his clothes. By the bits, didn't have to do that, Boy grumbled, running out to investigate. The crew followed and put a few bullets in the remains of the robots to be safe. Paulo was treated a tad better, offered a little cosmic potion, and then dragged back to base by Comariero. Hey, what was that? Shah excitedly asked him, taking him by the legs. The conducting pipes in the mover antennae give off powerful radiation at short range, Paulo managed to mutter. And that detonated your chemical concoction there? Never even tried it before. Blowing them up's easier than hacking them. That's good news for everyone but the IPA, I'd say. By the way, Char, can you see my stomach? Yes, there's a dirty big piece of metal stuck in it. So that's what that feeling is. 
man. Paulo was given a bed in the little medical room the crew had made beside the river. The dirty big piece of metal was a bit of an issue, so Kerma removed it. This would be enormously painful for Paulo, but given how difficult to come by proper painkillers were, there was some argument for proceeding without them. He killed Tumas. We can't treat him the same as everyone else, Lady argued to Comariero in the walk-in medical cupboard. You believe he should be treated as a slave then, Comariero replied. No, how could you say that? I mean, we can't just pretend he's our friend. He is our friend. Then he's your friend. He is dying because he used his magic to save us. Slave or chief, he is a friend. I don't know. If you don't know, why did you already make your decision? I just... I... just... can't we... <laughs> that is the better tone to take. Paulo ended up getting his dose of potion, and thanks to Kerma's careful sewing, he was soon in the clear, if still weak and bedridden. Now he really was just being an extra mouth to feed, but his wild, explosive display had made its mark. Boy brought him food, and Kerma changed his wrappings generously. Outside, there was now an effort to restore the peace of mind that their old fortress walls had given them, breaking up the surrounding area with long granite brick barriers. They were placed far enough out to encompass a farm like before, although for now, the most farm-like activity taking place was Boy tilling pale soil in a meditative state during the cool of the evenings. During these few days, it was decided that their new home be called The Last Castle. The pessimism in that name reflected the overall mood of its residents. Food remained an issue, but caravans from Pumpkinwell brought a variety of orange gunk-based rations up to trade for the crew's silver and gold, which had mostly been salvaged from Three Up Fort. That didn't last forever, and soon Staves was forced to part with most of his pet animals. All the furry lumps of various kinds he had collected from the south made for high-demand exotic pets up here on the plateau, which were traded for some more cave farm gear. In this way, the yields could steadily increase, while demand was lowered. Staves had saved the crew again, but if it had been up to him, he probably wouldn't have. Soon another big bloody chances meeting was held, this time stuffed inside the mini hospital so as to include Paulo. Paulo, we've come to an agreement, Boy began. Pretty simple, so I'll keep it brief. If you do everything you can to get us to the secret place, with the cosmic ship and all that, we'll make things right for you with Tumas. How's that sound? Sounds pretty good, man. If the IPA thinks I'm dead, then I've got a chance to escape here for real. And then, well, I'd be interested in getting a little payback, making up for lost time, if you get me. So you know how I'll feel, butter, Huntsman said. Yeah, I know. Sorry. That's all I can give you until we're up there. You can get your sorry self out of bed and help us prepare to leave, Boy said. We need enough food to walk bits knows how far. And more importantly, we need to know how ships from your era worked, Shar added. So if you don't mind, I'll also need you to scan out the details with me in the lab. Also, you have to help me build a lab. Which we can't do until we head back to bring up the rest of the junk from Three Up Ruins, Holt said. Plus, I need to get back in range of Bystone and tell them we're alive. Find out if they're alive too. Also, I left my hat there, Staves chipped in. Whatever is a plan then, isn't it? Boy said. Unless you've got a better idea, Wonk Father. Oh, that's me, Polo picked up. I gotta say I was waiting for one of you to come in and kill me, especially you, Huntsman. If the new plan is to use my powers for good, so to speak, then I ain't gonna stop you. IPA might, though. The rolling mass begins to obey the dark voices again, Comariero said. You know why this is, don't you? They're probably getting desperate, trying anything to finish us off. The whole planet, that is. They will fail though, won't they? Shar asked. Since you're the expert in the field, and you couldn't kill us from up there, if I understand correctly. Normally it would be possible, but the mover here is different. Sure, it had all the vulnerabilities I thought it would, but it wasn't responding to Marcom's signals properly. 
I think that's why they even sent me out here 50 Earth years back. They wanted to get started on Redicott this whole time, but the mover has this real washout of data that I can't explain. It's like it's become far more experienced than it should. Its neural net overrides orders based on a callback to that experience. So when the IPA, or me, tried to just turn everything over to uh, sterilize, as we said, nothing happened. It was as if the mover was saying it knew the implication and didn't want to. Not that it has wants, you know, but I can't explain it. That's easy, Shah said. Ask the tribal folk, they know all about that. I figured your tribes didn't have that level of education. But everybody already knows that the mass cannot be controlled, Comariero said. That was the lesson of the first roll-up. This mover you speak about, it is part of the mass, the agent of the Kote. It killed us before. It seemed to wish to do so again. There was a rumor from a long-lost zapper that the first roll-up was caused by someone like you trying to control the living metal below the surface. Hearing you talk makes me very happy, for now it is obvious. This roll-up is no different. The mass has no malice for us. It is only reacting to the malice of people like you. You're saying this happened before? When? In ages past. It was about 5,000 retikot years back. Maybe 800 spins on Earth, Shah said. Must have been when the IPA first formed, Polo reasoned. They failed right off the bat. Was that... They must have tried to cover it up. And someone like me, trying to get the word out that what they were doing was even possible? The Kote encompasses all worlds, Kerma nodded sagely. Not our world, Staves countered. That's because Pieces has no mover, silly, Shah counter countered. We have the Overlord. Must be better than whatever hollow madness you're all talking about, Boy said. Polo, Pieces is what we call One Bastia. Do you remember that? Like it was two months ago, since it was far as I see it, Polo nodded. The first planet to use only geomantic assembly, no mover required. We still didn't hear back from the colonists on Earth. It's all fine, Boy said, folding his arms. I think the IPA tried to kill them all recently too, Holt said. Didn't you guys say you got invaded and that's how you ended up here in the first place? Cosmic people. I don't know if it was the same as your cosmic people, Lady said. Oh, it's the same, Polo said. IPA must have had to do things the hard way with no mover to hack. Sounds like those guys are giving us all a rough time, huh? So, who is the Overlord? Staves asked. No one here, no one anywhere, Boy insisted. They're God, Shah whispered to Polo, who smiled at the Tindrans politely. Sounds like we got one big butternut option here, Huntsman said, dramatically pulling his hat lower over his face. We gotta get up there and blow the IPA all the way back to the core. Nice idea, but it's not that easy, man, Polo said. Then we can die that way, Comariero said. Kerma jumped up in agreement. If the mass wishes to be saved, offer us to die. Fighting those cosmic things gets us to the right line, she said. Doesn't matter all that, Boy said, because step one in any plan is to get fishing. If it does badly, we'll trade our slave here for pumpkins. Boy, you said no more of that, Lady complained. And the Overlord didn't like it one bit, but here we are. Through their meeting with Polo, the crew had developed a heroic dream to save the galaxy or something, and their journey of several trillion steps needed to begin with a single platter of fish cubes on cactus spikes. Looks like the next load of steps, as far as the eye can see, are pretty much the same thing too. As mentioned, they also needed to salvage the rest of the rare bits and bobs they didn't have space for when they left 3-Up Fort. For that purpose, Staves, Huntsman and Holt took the mega sheep and most of the food on a five-day trek back down the highway again seeing not a living soul the whole journey. Then again, you tended not to see much in the constant dark anyway, so no need to be too pessimistic, except for the constant dark bit. It was equally hard to keep chins up at the fort, seeing the ruins of so much hard work lying abandoned. 
They weren't the only ones to visit the site since the fall. The barren fields were covered in decaying animals, and on the edge of the walls there were a few human corpses in cosmic people clothing. The mountainside was littered with metallic debris and craters too. I would say someone crashed here, but given all the tears in the mud, I think it was more a case of being shot down by the Huntsman said. People are falling from the cosmos, like us, Stave said, looking up at the starry sky. The long night enhanced the starlight a little, and no doubt one of the points out there was the mother star of pieces. This is what Kerma means, the Kare gets you everywhere, Holt said. You don't really believe that, do you, Butter? Huntsman said. Believe my eyes, trucking OPA, wonder if they came to save us. Holt pointed out an OPA logo on one of the corpse's jackets. They knew we were here, led the IPA right to us. Or they would have. Makes me think they know we've ended up a few cuts above the usual trucking crew here. We're special, Stave summarized. You better be. Gave stuff up to get in with you, and scarier isn't even the real problem. Thought it was the end, just the trucking beginning, huh? The fort ruins were packed with blowwork salvage, and some of the external pipes and generators were intact even still. The three of them got to work taking stuff apart and loading what they could onto the mega sheep over the next day or so, sleeping in a pile of said mega sheep below the lively stars. They didn't do this especially quietly, and had to deal with a rather desperate band of Zospa tribe raiders scouring the mountainside for sustenance. When they came face to face with Huntsman and his assault rifle, a few were slain, then the rest took their poultry spears and moved on. We could give them some of the rice, then they might help us, Stave suggested after the action. That's not likely, Bard, Holt said. They might tell us what we want to hear for a while, but that's part of their trick. Second they can, they'd betray us. What about you? What? Isn't that the same thing for you? You might betray me. Probably not. What we're doing is a little different. It's because we need each other. Yeah, that's it. We can't live without each other, and there's no way to pretend it's any different. What are you getting at? Just thinking about it. Thoughts stay in your head, Bard. Not all the time. World ain't perfect, not yet. One of the major projects during their stay was to take down the remaining blowwork windmills. But before the last one was folded up, Holt plugged a translucent computer block into a pipe and got connected to the bystone comms beyond the mountain. You trucking scurveball! was Councillor Satsky's greeting for him. Suffice to say, she was a little upset that Holt had been missing presumed dead for a while. Huntsman and Staves had to give Holt a good hour of time alone with the windmill to sort this out. But eventually he returned to them. His face said it all. Roll-ups hard, break-ups are harder, Huntsman said. Not really a break-up. I should be happy they're doing okay, Holt said. They don't want you to go back? Staves asked. No, they do. That's the problem. Oh, I don't understand. That's why you're lucky, Stavesy, Huntsman said. When you know what you got, you know when you've lost it afterwards. Makes you want to go back and do the button nut all over again. But no choice. Gotta keep going. I know it's right, Holt said. Uh-huh. Too right, butter. Huntsman and Holt seemed to be sharing something, puzzling staves. But it all passed soon enough, as hungry stomachs kept them well aware of their time limit out there. After a little more hard work, the trio had amassed a new collection of irreplaceable miscellany. Most of the bits were stuffed into the megasheep bags, while the folded up giant blowwork windmills had to be dragged behind them, which caused them to accidentally invent animal driven plowing when they took the convoy down the mud road back north. Things got a little easier by the time they were dragging their heavy load along the highway, wincing at the constant grinding of the metal parts on the rough road. It was another miserable march, marked by rain, threat of attack, stale, spore-ridden food, and the general sense that all this wasn't going to help very much anyway. Meanwhile, in the fort, moods carried on fading also, with stocks of money, animals and pretty much anything not essential to keep them all alive were now expended. 
Plus, as Paulo had previously warned, there were loads more desperados taking up the secret IPA executioner job, causing bands of RFs and pirates to routinely stake out the last castle and occasionally try to get in. They were always beaten back, but the crew's ammunition and medical stashes weren't going to take it much more. The idea of marching off and leaving the planet was never so appealing, but never so difficult to achieve. The IPA were getting closer and closer to their clean slate, especially off across the rest of the planet, where untold suffering no doubt got worse by the day. Was there anything that could end the IPA's murderous greed? Well, actually there was, namely, their murderous greed. How does that work? I'll tell you next time.